This past week was a little hectic as the region prepared for both the upcoming holidays and the potential of a snowstorm of uncertain proportions. Coming up on this episode of The Eagle, we'll go over the top headlines. So far, nothing has turned up that's definitive in suggesting what this teenager's fate would be. And we'll hear the latest in the unusual case of a Connecticut man who was found dead in New York last week and also found to have been living a secret double life in the Hudson Valley. The week before this man died, he was using the name Richard King in New York. He had told his roommate, David, that he was going to begin receiving mail with a different name on it. This is The Eagle, a Times Union podcast, a look inside our newsroom. I'm Jessica Marshall. If you're enjoying this podcast, take advantage of all the Times Union has to offer and support our efforts to bring in you award-winning journalism by becoming a Times Union member today. Go to timesunion.com slash subscribe. Welcome to The Eagle. I'm Jessica Marshall. All right, let's discuss now what appeared in the Times Union and on timesunion.com this week. All right, we are here once again with Times Union Editor-in-Chief Casey Seiler. We're going to talk about the top news this week on Times Union and timesunion.com. Um, let's start with the case of a missing teen in Schenectady. She's been missing for about three weeks, and the search just kind of kicked up a notch in a way this week. So can you tell us what's happening there? Yeah, Samantha Humphrey, who is 14 years old, has been missing for um, a little bit more than three weeks now. Um, she was last seen on surveillance video near the edge of the Mohawk River in, in Riverside Park, which is in the Stockade neighborhood in Schenectady. She was seen on this footage going in, not seen coming out of the park, which doesn't necessarily mean she didn't leave, but it has been enough for uh, a great deal of the search's uh, energy and focus going to that geographic area and the stockade neighborhood in general. There have been dive teams out there, uh, you know, state police patrol boats as well. DEC piloted a drone along the river's edge as part of the search. But so far, nothing has turned up that's definitive in suggesting what this teenager's fate would be. I really hope this is one of those cases where in between the time we're recording this and the time people are listening to it, some positive news comes up. Of course, this time of year, we have had a number of stories, bulletins about teens going missing, and um, happily, the vast majority of those end with our ability to to essentially warehouse that story after noting that uh, the teen has been you know, reconnected with, with family or friends. But so far, in this case, uh, no such luck. We'll stick by timesunion.com for any developments that happen there. And I will tease to later in this podcast, we are going to be talking about another missing persons case, one that is quite unusual. Um, so stay tuned for that. But let's move on to Congress now, where I guess one could describe this as one of the only ways that you could conceivably say Congress member Elise Stefanik, who is a Republican, kind of agrees maybe a little with her Capital Region counterparts across the aisle in calling for more transparency from the FBI on how they handled an informant that was involved peripherally in the Schoharie limo crash case. So can you kind of break that down for us? Yeah, this is, you know, we've we've discussed the limo crash, of course, before, but this is specifically about Congresswoman Stefanik's efforts to press the FBI to be more transparent about its dealings with Shahed Hussein, who is the patriarch of the Hussein family. He was the owner of Prestige Limousine, which, of course, is the company that owned the decrepit stretch Ford excursion that was involved in the 2018 limo crash in which 20 people died. Stefanik really uh, amped up her criticism and was joined by uh, Representative Paul Tonko earlier this year, specifically after the release of a New York Magazine piece, which was uh, an excellent 
piece of journalism, a uh, kind of reignited interest in Shahed Hussein's role in Prestige Limousine and the fact that Hussein for years had been a confidential informant working with the FBI on counterterrorism efforts. Now, what is new here is that Stefanik earlier this week put out a statement lambasting the FBI for what she says is a continued lack of transparency about its relatively freshly launched internal probe into its uh, handling of Shahed Hussein and uh, other related matters. And Stefanik said uh, that she had recently received a letter from the FBI that she found to be just uh, woefully insufficient. And of course, we asked for a copy of the letter and uh, she uh, declined to produce it in whole or part. And when asked why, her office cited uh, unnamed uh, sensitivities, I believe was the term, but didn't explain what exactly those those sensitivities were. So a uh, case of the transparency shoe being on the other foot, as it were. I don't know if that sentence has ever been uttered before, but it, that's a good one. We, Breaking boundaries once again, Jess, so. Yes. And that was more excellent reporting from Larry Rulison, our business reporter, who has been covering this story for the last four years and breaking all kinds of news about it. Let's go over to Albany now, where the Roman Catholic Diocese of Albany has requested to pause the litigation for a couple of months. Uh, that's brought by hundreds of plaintiffs who filed child sexual abuse lawsuits against them. So can you tell us what's going on there? Yeah, the attorneys for the diocese are asking for a stay that would be 120 days in the uh, court cases, the civil cases that are upcoming. Some of them are scheduled to begin in January. These are, of course, the cases that were enabled to be filed by the Child Victims Act, which lifted the statute of limitations on claims of child sexual abuse including, of course, those by members of the clergy. What we appear to have here is a little bit of a game of chicken, if you will, between the efforts to mediate a global settlement with the scores and scores of alleged victims, uh, you know, who have charged the diocese with playing a role in their, their alleged victimization, and the diocese's threats, I think, would probably be the, the proper term to declare bankruptcy, which they say would, um, number one, you know, slow down the ability for the plaintiffs to get justice and also just be uh, very costly for the diocese and by extension for, for the victims as well. Now, the plaintiff's attorneys, many of them, have said that the mediation efforts have bogged down, that the diocese's uh, last offer of you know the amount of money that would essentially fill the settlement fund was, uh, was woefully inadequate. We will see what the state Supreme Court justice who is overseeing these cases will rule in response to the diocese's offer for the stay. But it is, of course, a very big story with implications for for the victims, as well as just folks who are members of the Albany Roman Catholic Diocese. And once again, this is just great reporting from um, from Brendan Lyons. Absolutely. Head on over to timesunion.com to read more about that. Let's move on to some nature news right now. Apparently, um, we found out that this week the Capital Region may be home to New York State's largest tree. Yeah, and maybe one of the biggest trees in the country. This is an eastern cottonwood that sits on the floodplain outside of Scaticoke, which is, of course, right along the, the Hudson River. And this is just a, a fantastic story that Melissa Mano, who works for our business department, wrote about speaking with um, Fred Breglia, who uh, is uh, one of these folks who documents enormous trees. And the photos are amazing, a 34-foot circumference. I mean, it looks like it makes the, the redwoods of Northern California look like uh, pikers. And it's likely between two and three centuries old. 
which wow. is really remarkable to think what we're talking about is a is a tree that was standing a half a century before the Declaration of Independence was signed. Wow. Yes, definitely head over to timesunion.com to check out those photos. And if you've ever spent maybe five minutes with Fred Breglia, you know that that guy knows trees really well. So. And, and I'd just like to point out as well that this story crushed it in terms of online performance. It was a top story for us for days and days and days as we're discussing it now. So it, it just shows that um, it doesn't need to be a horrible story. I mean, we've been talking about some very heavy stories of death and abuse and contention. And it is good to see that a story that's really <laughs> at least celebrating the life of a of a two or three century old tree can can do so well with an audience just because it's it was so fascinatingly crafted and and the subject clearly resonated. Absolutely. Now, another story that tends to do well with our audience, which we've been following for a little while now, is the potential sale of a home in Saratoga Springs that was owned by uh, perhaps some of the area's most well-known socialites. Uh, I'm talking about Palazzo Riggi up in Saratoga, and there were some developments up there with uh, a potential sale. So what happened there? Uh, yeah, a sale that fell through. <laughs> Adam Weitzman, who is a, a scrap metal magnate, Another phrase that you don't hear very often, uh, we reported, uh, gosh, I guess it was about two and a half months ago, perhaps, that he was going to buy Palazzo Riggi, which had been on the market at almost 18 million. We do not know if that's what Mr. Weitzman was offering to pay for it, however. But now it is back on the market because Mr. Weitzman is backing out. And the quote that he uh, provided to Mike Goodwin and Pete DeMola uh, was everybody has different styles and things, and it wasn't really a style that resonated with me. In the end, I just didn't have a personal connection with the property. Now, we should note that when we reported that he had put in an offer on the house, he hadn't even walked through it. <laughs> so Palazzo Riggi has a very definite and rather ornate style to it. So you would think that he might have noticed that the style might not exactly have been um, in keeping with, with his aesthetic before putting an offer down on it. But to anybody who wants to surprise that special someone in their life, Palazzo Riggi is back on everyone's Christmas list. <laughs> yes, Palazzo Riggi is a whole vibe. Check out the photos on timesunion.com. All right, Casey, thank you so much. We will check back in with you next week. Thanks, Jess. As always, you can learn more about all of the topics and the issues that we discuss on this podcast at timesunion.com. After the break, Robert Hoagland vanished 10 years ago from his home in Newtown, Connecticut. Last week, he was found dead in Sullivan County, New York, where he'd been living under another name. We'll have the latest on this unusual case. If you're enjoying this podcast, take advantage of all the Times Union has to offer and support our efforts to bring in you award-winning journalism by becoming a Times Union member today. Go to timesunion.com slash subscribe. Welcome back. You're listening to The Eagle, a Times Union podcast. I'm Jessica Marshall. In July of 2013, Robert Hoagland vanished. The white father of three from Newtown, Connecticut, was supposed to pick up his wife from JFK International Airport in New York. She'd been returning from a trip abroad. But he never showed up. He left all of his belongings behind, all his money, all his identification. Police were stumped. His disappearance even garnered national attention. Police in Newtown, Connecticut are asking you to be on the lookout for a man missing from their town, Warwick and West Warwick Police say someone believes they saw this man, 50-year-old Robert Hoagland along Route 117 near Interstate 95. Hoagland, a new Flash forward a little more than nine years. Earlier this month, about 85 miles from Newtown, a man named Richard King was found dead in the room that he rented in Rock Hill, New York. 
His housemate, David, found him and called 911. Police couldn't find any identification on the body or among his possessions. The only thing they did find were a few pieces of mail addressed to one Robert Hoagland. The man who had vanished without a trace in Connecticut in 2013 had been living under a false name in the Hudson Valley for almost a decade. The Times Union's Hudson Valley managing editor, Philip Pantuso, has been reporting on this very strange case. I pulled him aside to get the latest. Tell me from your perspective, like, how did this story come to you? How did you first uh, take it in? Well, we first heard about it when our colleagues over at Hearst, Connecticut, wrote the story that um, this man who had been missing for nine years, Robert Hoagland, uh, was found dead in Sullivan County. And I was like, that sounds interesting. (laughs) Missing person stories generally have a bit of intrigue about them, yes? (laughs) Yeah. A man had called reporting a medical emergency that his roommate was experiencing when police responded to the scene. They couldn't find identification for the name that the roommate had given them, but they did find documentation with this other name on it. That name was Robert Hoagland. And at that point, the the roommate typed that name into Google and found... As um, one does. As one does. He was like, okay. And found, uh, you know, all of these news articles from, from 2013, 2014, 2015 about this man, Robert Hoagland, who would vanish seemingly without a trace from his life and his family in Connecticut. It's, I mean, it's mind blowing, but I did not know that there, he was a missing person. You know, yeah. I, I, that I didn't know. Well, why, why would you, why would anyone assume that, right? <laughs> right. Da- the roommate, whose name is David, um, he didn't want to be identified beyond that. Did he find that out before the police did? As far as we can tell, yeah. And what's, what's kind of interesting is that in the week before the week before this man died, he was using the name Richard King in New York. He had told his roommate, David, that he was going to begin receiving mail with a different name on it. they had been living together for nine years at this point. And so he's actually the one who apparently, as far as we can tell, typed the name into Google, discovered that this person who had been missing from Connecticut for nine years was the same man he had been living with for basically that entire time and was the dead man in bed. Well, that is quite a thing to discover. Certainly, yeah. I think he was pretty devastated. I talked to him first on Thursday, which was three days after um, his roommate had died, and a day really after the news had become public. And we just had a kind of, not, not a formal interview, just a sort of conversation sitting in the living room of their house. And he was clearly pretty broken up. And then we had a more formal interview a few days later where he was able to share what he knew about his his friend and roommate, uh, Richard King, a guy, a guy he called Rich, just what their life was like together for the, these past nine years. I mean, he lived in his half of the house. I lived in my half of the house, and, and we just left each other alone. You know, we were just friends, and, you know, we would, every Sunday, we would make food together and watch sports and talk a little bit. That's it. There's two sides to this person, this deceased person. Let's go with his New York life. Tell me about Richard King. Tell me about what David said about Richard King and, you know, how he came into his life and how he lived his life in New York. So Robert Hoagland had disappeared. He was last seen July 29th, 2013. A couple of months later, about 100 miles west in uh, the town of Thompson in southern Sullivan County, this man named David put an ad on Craigslist. He was seeking a roommate. His marriage had just ended and he needed help making the rent. He's a music teacher there and he also plays music gigs around the area and down in New York City. A man calling himself Richard King responded to that Craigslist ad. He said that he was also recently separated from his wife and he was new to the area. When David asked him for identification, he didn't have any, which you know naturally troubled him, but he did say that he was employed and that his employer would vouch for him. So David called his place of employment. It's, it's a real estate appraiser firm in that area. And they said, yes, he, he is employed there. Now, we did a record search and there's nobody by either the name Richard King or Robert Hoagland who's licensed as a residential real estate appraiser in New York. We can't definitively say how that operation worked. The real estate appraiser company is 
not responding to us. But, uh, you know, he did have stable employment. And on or around um, November 2013, the man calling himself Richard King moved in with David. And they lived together in one house in this little hamlet called Rock Hill from that time until the summer of 2020, at which point David, who had achieved more seniority at school and had a little bit more success as a professional musician, was able to buy a house less than a mile away in town. He had really come to be close friends with Rich and enjoy living together. So he asked if they would like to continue living together and Rich said yes. So that's the house they moved into about two years ago and that's the house where he died. Rich always paid in cash. He had a car that was loaned to him by work. It doesn't seem like he had too many friends around town, but he did volunteer at a soup kitchen, uh, the Sullivan County Federation for the Homeless, particularly around the holidays, which we thought was kind of a poignant detail because in his prior life as Robert Hoagland, he had worked as a chef before becoming a, a real estate appraiser in Connecticut. If you were to talk to anybody that knew him, you would know that he was just one of the greatest people that you could meet. I mean, and I, I'm not saying that in a hyperbolic sense. He really was just a great guy. I I wasn't expecting to, you know, to have somebody that just answered a, a um, you know, a request for a roommate to become, you know, one of my best friends. But that's what happened over the years. Can you just briefly summarize the circumstances of his death? We're not precisely sure how he died, and autopsy records um, are not going to be made public um, because the police don't suspect any foul play here. We know that he was uh, that he had high blood pressure, and apparently he had been in some declining health. About six months before he died, according to David, he had visited the hospital. They had kind of changed his diet a little bit, and. Um, David noticed, um, looking back on some security camera footage, the last time that Richard came home was on Friday night before he died on either Sunday or Monday. And as he was entering the house, he was like kind of clutching his back, moving quite slowly, seemed to be in some pain. And one of one of David's theories about why, why he had revealed that he would be receiving mail under a different name was that he was either going to try to get health insurance or that he was going to make end of life arrangements. All right. So we you've told us everything that we know up till now from Richard King's life in New York. What do we know about Robert Hoagland? Yeah, so Robert Hoagland, he was living in in Newtown, Connecticut. He he had a wife and he had three kids. The the kids were all grown, although the youngest of them had struggled with some substance abuse issues and had recently moved back home. He seems to have had a fairly normal life in Connecticut. Um, He had met his wife actually at the Culinary Institute of America. There's the cooking tie. Yeah, and and he had worked for for some years as a chef, but kind of mid-career, he he got tired of the hours and wanted, I think, more stable employment. So he got his residential real estate appraiser's license in Connecticut and began working as a real estate appraiser in that state. Certainly there's been no reporting in all the years since he went missing to suggest that there was some compelling reason for him to leave. Exactly. I think that's why it's been such a, such a mystery to everybody. What we know of the last kind of week of his life or thereabouts in Connecticut is that um, his wife was on a trip abroad in Turkey. And while she was there, um, two of the family's laptop computers were stolen. And Robert came to believe that his son had taken them either to sell or to exchange in order to obtain drugs. He sent an email to his wife being very sort of apologetic and, and seeming to express some amount of shame that he had kind of let this happen. Police investigators in Connecticut later learned that Robert had traveled to this abandoned industrial building in nearby Bridgeport to confront some men who they described as his son's associates, quote unquote, Mm -hmm. over the theft. And then that same day or the following day, he withdrew $600 in cash. 
the last time he was seen on camera was uh, the day before he vanished on July 28th. There's security camera footage from a mobile gas station in Newtown that just captured him checking out. Uh, I think I think he was buying a map of the eastern United States, which hmm. potentially a red flag, but apparently he liked to collect maps and he had maps, you know, all over. Mm-hmm. And on July 29th, he was supposed to pick up his wife at JFK in a national airport in New York City and never showed up. That morning, he had reportedly mowed the lawn, which his son confirmed, but he was never seen again alive. And he had left behind his phone, his wallet, his keys. Uh, He'd even left behind quite a bit of cash, apparently, in a personal safe. Robert Hoagland's disappearance, you know, didn't go under the radar, right? I mean, his story was featured on a true crime podcast and some TV shows like and then there's an episode of the TV docuseries disappeared about it as well did Robert Hoagland walk away from his life or is he the victim of foul play how do you explain somebody just vanishing off the face of the earth what happened after he disappeared yeah yeah it was a, it was a big story Certainly in, in Connecticut, and it got quite a bit of national coverage at the time as well. There was a huge search effort on, you know, anniversaries, at least the first couple of anniversaries, the family would ho- hold like vigils um, and they, they would renew their efforts to publicize their, you know, missing loved one. There have been a handful of unconfirmed sightings, mostly between 2013 and 2016. All of these are unconfirmed. There's an end to the story, but there's still a lot of mystery left. Yeah, there's still quite a bit of mystery. Um, You know, the central one being, why exactly did he leave? There's nothing that would tell me why he would, you know, sort of up and disappear. I just assumed that he had gotten divorced and he, you know, needed to start a new life. Yeah, I'm just as shocked and confused as as I think anybody else as to why, you know. David told me that he doesn't really know. Richard, when they were living together, really didn't talk much about his family. And when he did, it was always in the past tense. What David told me is that everything that he did share about his family is true. Um, And he would share details about things he liked to do with them, you know, working on an old Volvo with his oldest son or taking family trips to to Hilton Head, South Carolina. It doesn't seem like he had contact with them uh, and he didn't really say anything that would suggest such a compelling reason to, to abandon them, essentially. So we don't totally know why this happened. I'm not sure that we'll ever know. We'd like to be able to talk to the family at some point, but I think that's gonna have to wait. All right, that's it for this week. I'm Jessica Marshall. We'll be back next week with another look inside the newsroom here at the Times Union. In the meantime, check us out on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram, or head on over to timesunion.com for the latest news and features. The Eagle is a production of the Times Union. It's produced and edited by me, Jessica Marshall, with help from the Times Union digital team and the newsroom. Special thanks this week to Casey Seiler and Philip Pantuso for their contributions to this episode. And stay tuned. We've got a brand new podcast series by the Times Union debuting very soon. Here's a taste of what's in store. It's been 15 years since 12-year-old Jalik Rainwalker vanished. His disappearance from rural upstate New York was ruled a probable child homicide. But no one has ever been charged, and his body has never been found. This is Rainwalker, the Lost Boy. I'm Jessica Marshall. And I'm Wendy Lepertor. 
In this podcast from the Times Union, we'll take a deep dive into this mystery, the case of a missing child that has unsettled New York's capital region and beyond for more than a decade. Coming soon, wherever you listen to podcasts.